Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, thank you all for, for joining us now for the official open of the day two of the Concordia Summit. Uh, we hope you all enjoyed yesterday. I know we have a very, very exciting uh, day today. Uh, I am particularly excited about this as the opening session um, for a couple of reasons. The first is the respect that I hold for one of the greatest public-private partnerships in the world, Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, um, which is really a leading P3, remember we call them here at Concordia P3s, aimed at catalyzing the global community to reduce deaths from cervical and breast cancer in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, and raises awareness and increasing access to quality services to detect and treat them. It was launched by the George W. Bush Institute, um, along with PEPFAR, Susan G. Komen, um, and UN AIDS. But the other reason I'm particularly excited about this session is uh, to introduce to you a good friend of mine, a great friend of mine, Ambassador Nancy Brinker, someone I have immense respect for, someone who has done incredible work her entire lives fighting for women, um, and, and as the founder of Susan G. Komen, somebody who has done more to, uh, to, to help those with breast cancer, suffering from breast cancer, than I think about any other person in the world. So uh, it is my honor to, uh, to introduce to you um, Ambassador Nancy Brinker, the chair of global strategy now at Susan G. Komen for the Cure. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for inviting me this morning, all of you. Um, uh, thank you for the time you're investing in learning more about this amazing program, of which I'm going to speak a little bit. Um, innovative, life-saving program known as Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon. Um, I'm always cautious when I'm asked to uh, help inform people about an important program or initiative, and I'm reminded of the second grade boy uh, who was asked to write a paper on Socrates. He handed in a two-sentence report that read, Socrates went around telling other people what to do. They killed him. So hopefully I will avoid that today. <laughs> and I know this group is much more about being a receptive audience, I know you want to hear a little bit, so I want to sort of tell you the story of Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon as an entree into what I know will be a fascinating panel today and an opportunity for all of you here to support it. It's a partnership that continues to grow, coming together to fight AIDS and cancer in Africa, and it's important because the two diseases are unfortunately intertwined. Women with HIV are four to five times more likely to develop cervical cancer than women who are HIV negative. Breast cancer as well. A lack of access to screening means that women can go undiagnosed until its latest stages. In Africa, there are women who show up at clinics with tumors the size of lemons, and there's often little doctors can do for them. Cervical cancer takes more than 50,000 lives each year in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's unbelievable. Breast cancer claims thousands more, becoming a full-blown epidemic. And um, the countries have some of the highest rates of these diseases in the world, and most of the deaths are avoidable because, like HIV, cervical and breast cancer are treatable and often preventable. Uh, most people in the United States think of them as diseases that mostly strike older women. In fact, that's not true. In Africa, however, they strike young women in the peak of their productive and reproductive years. In Zambia or Botswana, deaths from women's cancer wreck the same havoc as those from AIDS. Children lose their protectors and providers. The fabric of families and communities fray, and societies lose a source of prosperity, stability, and growth. In 2007, I was privileged uh, as chief of protocol to join President and Mrs. Bush on a trip to Tanzania to visit a clinic supported by the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or as though many of us who know it, PEPFAR. And as we observed the incredible work being done there, I was struck by how simple it would be to extend that work even further to education and screening about women's cancers. After all the time, effort, and resources put into saving lives from AIDS, we were then losing many of the lives to preventable diseases like cancer. Something had to be done. I saw the faces of these young mothers holding their babies outside of the PEPFAR tents and thinking how easy it would be to extend their lives even more. Later, like many great ideas, 
The original plan for Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon came to fruition not in a memo or planning document, but instead on the back of a cocktail napkin. Upon returning home, we began to reach out to groups we knew could help, the Bush Institute, PEPFAR, and the Joint United Nations Program on HIV AIDS, or UN AIDS. And at a hotel bar near the UN headquarters, the executive director of UN AIDS and one of my favorite people, Michelle Sidibe, and I began to sketch out what this program would look like. From the beginning, we knew that we wanted active corporate and philanthropic partners, not just for greater resources, but for greater reach, support, networking, and impact. And when we launched Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon in 2011, we were pleased to be joined by companies like Merck, like Becton Dickinson, like Bristol Myers Squibb, GlaxoSmithKline, and Kiagen. Major philanthropies like the Gates Foundation and the Keras Foundation contributed as well. In the years that have followed, Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon has grown to five countries, Tanzania, Zambia, Botswana, and now Ethiopia and Namibia. We have taken the lessons we learned in the developed world and we're applying them to the developing nations. We emphasize education, vaccination, screening, and treatment. We get strong goals and continue to partner with a diverse group of corporations, charitable groups, organizations, community groups, multilateral organizations, and governments so that we can get access to as many women as possible. And one of our goals is to get more governments of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa to actually contribute and buy into this program so they too will be a full partner and investor in the health of the women who live there. Since its founding, Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon Partners have screened nearly 200,000 women for cervical cancer and vaccinated more than 42,000 girls against the human papillovirus, or HPV, which causes most cervical cancer. Now the government of Botswana is using its own resources to expand this HPV vaccination program to cover all girls between 9 and 13. And as the program continues to grow, I look forward to the thousands of more lives that can be saved. The key to Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon is that our search for innovation goes far beyond scientific research. It's the natural next step. It's important that we don't fall into the trap of thinking that life-saving breakthroughs only happen in laboratories. We must keep our eyes open to opportunities where change in approach can also save lives. In the years since we began Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, I've returned to Africa and visited the clinics and institutes. I've met the women being helped, held their hands, heard their stories, given them a hug. And we are giving these women more than education and treatment. We are giving them hope. We're doing what the STGs want for us, produce and help the enrichment of countries through the power of public-private partnerships. And I thank all of you in this room who've helped us with this fight. It's not easy. None of this work is. It always takes longer than we imagine, but we have to keep imagining. As we move into the era of the Sustainable Development Goals, we're going to need more partnerships like this one. I invite you to learn from our experience and come with us on this journey because saving the life of one woman saves the life of hundreds of thousands of women. Come and join us. It will be one of the best things you've ever done in your life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Brinker. Um, and, now, and now, allow me to introduce to the stage Secretary Margaret Spellings, the president of the George W. Bush Center, former U.S. Secretary of Education, Panga Mitsali, the director of the Bristol, uh, Bristol Myers Scribb Foundation, Dr. Julie Gerberding, Executive Vice President for Strategic Communications, Global Public Policy, and Population Health at Merck, and William Steiger, the Interim CEO of Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon. Right, thank you, Matt. Congratulations to Concordia on five terrific years and for your leadership and your promotion of public-private partnerships. And thank you for featuring this one. We're very proud of it. When you get some Texans together to start bragging on themselves, it could go on a while. But anyway, we'll try to be uh, contain ourselves this morning. Thank you, Nancy, Ambassador Brinker, for your incredible leadership for so many decades, for your vision, for your staying power. You really are an inspiration to all of us. 
uh, those of us who are newer on the, on the battlefield. So yesterday was an information and action-packed day, and I know this one will be as well. We're thrilled that you all got up this morning to learn more about this incredible partnership that we've created in really a pretty short period of time. I am the chairman of the board of directors of the new and improved Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon entity, which is now uh, its own 501c3 organization, which gives us the benefit of being uh, of having all the advantages of being a startup with an incredible track record that we've developed over the last several years. Uh, just last week at the Global Women's Network Summit that we held in Dallas, including the participation, of course, of Mrs. Laura Bush and Mrs. Michelle Obama, now for the third year together teaming up, uh, as well as, of course, President Bush, we featured and discussed the many ways that are, that are uh, being engaged to, to help women and girls around the world. We are thrilled that our, at our event last week, President Bush announced the creation of this new entity uh, that will give us additional flexibility to do what we need to do uh, on the ground and in country uh, with all the right infrastructure. We're also thrilled that Ambassador Debbie Burks, uh, who leads the U.S. government's AIDS work, announced a $7 million commitment to this effort as well. So the punchline is we are strong and here to stay. And we uh, are mighty and picking up steam along the way. As uh, Nancy and Matt said, Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon was founded in September of 2011, just a few years ago, with four incredible partners, Susan G. Komen, uh, UNAIDS, the U.S. government, and the Bush Foundation. Since it, its inception, we have now grown to 20 partners, grown and growing to 20 partners, and are working in five countries, Botswana, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Namibia, and, and uh, Zambia. We have screened now more than 200,000 women for cervical cancer. Those of you who are accountability hawks like me who love data uh, will find it in Pink Ribbon with over 6,000 women being screened at, and treated for breast cancer. 42,000 girls have received the HPV vaccine. The scale up has been rapid and we have now begun to engender the support within the governments of Botswana and Tanzania to plan for the full local ownership and operation of these initiatives within the ministries of health. These programs uh, have been incubated and are now on, uh, on course for long-term success. In demonstrating country ownership, Botswana, for example, has already taken HPV vaccination nationwide using its own resources to fund the rollout. All Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon countries of engagement have incorporated this strategy in their national cancer plans. And when we launched Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon in Ethiopia with the First Lady uh, in February of this year, they were the first country to dedicate national funds to the effort. But all this success, of course, would not be possible if we were working alone. As Nancy said, it is strengthened by this incredible partnership. We are working with partners in the United States and Europe, with local nonprofit organizations, global philanthropies, private sector companies, and on and on. And this morning, as you would find at the Concordia Summit, we are focusing on these partnerships, P3 as you all like to call them. And we're fortunate to have with us several leaders in the field of global health. Uh, we all keep showing up with different hats over the many years, but uh, we're all continuing to work. Dr. Julie Gerberdeen, Executive Vice President for Strategic Communications, Global Public Policy and Population Health at Merck. Is that it? All right. <laughs> Pongi Mshali, Director of Secure the Future at Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation and Bill Steiger, Interim Chief Executive Officer of Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon. So I'm gonna ask a couple questions to each of the panelists and then you all will have your bite at the apple and I'll see if, I, if a troglodyte like me can make this technology work. Uh, so please save me and submit a question. And Julie, uh, Merck has been an incredible partner from, from the early, early days of Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon. And you obviously see the value in partnerships. Tell us about that. What have you gained from, from being an active participant in this relationship? Thank you, and thanks for including me on this wonderful panel. You know, I uh, went to a wonderful HIV clinic in Kenya 
soon after I joined Merck, and I saw these women who were being treated with state-of-the-art therapy for their retrovirus infection. I was speaking with one of the patients, and the person sitting next to her began to bleed from her womb, and there was blood on the floor. And to make a long story short, she was literally bleeding to death from undiagnosed cervical cancer. And that image of this beautiful clinic and the hope that HIV retroviral therapy was creating, and yet we had done nothing about her cancer and her cancer risk, really stabbed me in the heart. And I think what I became committed to as a consequence of, of that at Merck was um, no woman should die of cervical cancer. This is a completely preventable disease. It's a disease that can be diagnosed early and treated on the spot and ultimately one that we should not tolerate as a condition of uh, quality medical services. So for Merck, um, we obviously have a strong interest in the primary prevention through the vaccine, but we know we can't think of prevention as a one-legged stool. It's a three-legged stool. We need the vaccine to protect young girls. We need screening to find early cases so they can be treated, and then ultimately we need the ability to treat advanced cancers because there are still way more women in the world who will suffer and die because we're not there yet with, with, their, with that kind of treatment. And no one company could possibly do very much about that three-legged stool, but together we can do a lot. And I think that was the beauty of finding the pink ribbon, red ribbon. It's a, lots, a thousand flowers blooming, um, lots of projects going on all over uh, the developing world. But somebody needed to bundle them into a big bouquet so that we could really see the difference. We could learn how to make this happen to scale. And we could find the partnerships and the commitments across a hopefully growing diaspora of people who can really step up in governments, in NGOs, and in the private sector to truly change the game here. And I think that's, that's the, the, the motivation for Merck to participate and certainly the reason why I've been thrilled to be a part of Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon and, and, and remain one of its biggest champions. Thank you for that. So as a physician, obviously, the, the power of the vaccine just in, in numbers and stemming the tide over decades is so critical. Talk about that in, in those medical uh, data type terms. One of the remarkable things is we, ha we have uh, two great vaccines for cervical cancer that treat the two most common causes of cervical cancer, two of the most common types, and a new vaccine that Merck just launched that actually extends that to seven strains. So uh, with the seven strains for cancer and two for genital warts, we can actually prevent more than 90% of all cervical cancer. That's phenomenal. This is a vaccine that prevents cancer. Just think about that. But of course, it's also sometimes perceived as a vaccine that promotes sex. And so one of the biggest barriers we have wherever we try to introduce the vaccine campaign is that we have to make people understand that virus, cancer, there's a relationship there. So preventing the virus can actually prevent and, and protect the cancer. And that, that's, a, that's a tough um, issue, which is why the education component of what Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon does is so important. Um, but I want to just make sure everyone understands the possibility in Rwanda, more than 97% of eligible girls have received all three doses of their cervical cancer vaccine um, through a committed government, a strong leadership in the health uh, ministry, and the, the support of, of Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, and many other partners. So it, it's, it is very feasible to offer population-based protection. It just takes commitment and will. And with Gavi, which is the funding mechanism, we can bring affordable vaccines in. So the money part of it is no longer the barrier. It's the implementation challenge. So that's a great place for us to jump off and talk to Pangi. Um, so you're on the ground, and you, uh, as, the, as the leader of the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation there, talk about working at the community level and, and what you see in the implementation realm. Thank you very much, and once again, thanks for including us on this panel. Well, I can say that um, when you're talking about implementation, one of the things that um, at Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation we knew very early on that we had to look at was building the local capacity. 
because uh, even I am based in Johannesburg. Uh, my company is in the US, but we are working in Tanzania as well as in Ethiopia with Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon. We're not there all the time. So it's very, very important for that sustainability that we build local capacity, that we find indigenous organizations and we train them and we support them so that they can actually take on, um, on the issue themselves. And I think that's, that's another good part that I found actually in partnering with Pink Ribbon, uh, Red Ribbon and all the other partners that are there. <clears throat> We're very focused on community-based interventions. We're very focused on community systems strengthening. But as, as the previous panelist has just said, that is just the beginning. That is where we need to fight, that's where we need to get the information, that's where we need to deal with stigma, that's where the, the funerals are happening. Um, but once we have done all of that, uh, Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon was able to bring other partners for that continuum of care. Our focus is very much on awareness, on empowering women, on making sure that the community is supportive of, of any endeavors, but those women still need to get to the health facility. And when they get to the health facility, the other partners within Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon put in their bit. So it is really, really a collaborative effort. And from Bristol Masquerade Foundation, we've always said since um, 1999, when we worked in HIV, we said we have to seek for locally relevant solutions. It has to be locally relevant, and hence, communication, the engagement, the consultation with the local governments, NGOs, stakeholders, and Africa is a very interesting uh, a, a, a part of the world, as we all know. The grandmother has a say. Mm -hmm. If the grandmother says that young woman is not going to do that because has not born a son for this family, it ain't gonna happen mm -hmm. until we talk to the grandmother in the way that the grandmother needs to, need to understand what that, uh, that vaccination means, what that uh, 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 treatment, you know, that, that, that relevant and life-saving uh, treatment through see and treat. Um, uh, unless they understand that when the woman is there for those 20 minutes, we're saving the life, but we're not taking away the womanhood. Mm -hmm. We're not taking away the reason that they came into this family to make this family. Uh, bigger, And I just think that, uh, and that's why when we go out there through the pink ribbon, red ribbon, we need to have that united face. And we do have the united face with everybody bringing um, the expertise, everybody taking care of those things that the doctors may not necessarily think about. They are there, you're there, you're a woman, <clears throat> you have an issue, they, can, they know they can help you. And then they get surprised when you say, well, I, I, I can't just do it right now. I must go back and consult. And that's where the Bristol Mask Foundation Secure the Future comes in because we, have, we would have been in the community by then to talk to the grandmother, to talk to the husband, to talk to the chief if need be. Yeah. So we have 20 plus partners right now and maybe at the 10 year anniversary of Concordia we'll have 200 partners. What advice do you have for people who are contemplating working on this, working on the ground as you all are? Uh, what, what, you've obviously learned some lessons the hard way. What advice do you have for people who are coming on board? Well, the first advice I have is that do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, don't be shy. Yes, there are challenges. Do it. But try and, um, and, and find platforms such as the Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon. Uh, people that have been there. Try and go in where some, some gains have been made so that you don't start from scratch. I mean, uh, uh, from the Bristol Manuscript Foundation, we work in, in China and India and in many other places. And when we go, like we did in 1999, you spend so much time trying to build that partnership, trying to, and to get that trust. But if it already has been done through Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, then you just go in and you do the work that needs to be done. So that's the first thing, is that know who is on the ground, know who, whose vision uh, uh, you share and then partner with those people. The second one is that, um, it, 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 well, th this, is, this is actually not, not even something that I, that, I, that I need to say, but I'll say it because I'm, I'm an African. We, we really have to have respect of the local solutions, of the local experts, 
of our governments. I, and I always say coming from there, you know, pure people are very proud because sometimes pride is the only thing that we have. So it's very important that when you go in there, you go in there in a most respectful of manners. Uh, you, you ask, you listen. You know, there's a sense of agency. Women are dying. They are bleeding in our rooms. Um, but there's a sense of agency. But at the same time, we need to win uh, governments to be on our side. We need to win the women. We need to even win and prepare and train those healthcare providers that are there. So it's, it's, it's that whole thing of just being respectful, working with the ones that have been there, asking the ones that have been there the way and partnering with them and respecting the locals. I'm glad Pangy's on our side. Let me just say that. Um, so Bill, I love the way you put it, Julie, about the thousand flowers blooming being gathered into a bouquet. Where were you when we were designing the logo? That's what I want to know. So, Bill, you're the, the gardener uh, for the bouquet, for the, not to torture the, this analogy, but talk about the challenges and the opportunities of gathering people together so that everyone is knitted together and pulling in the same direction. Sure. Our biggest challenge, I think, is a great one to have, which is complexity. Now that we have as many partners as we do, working off unified plans in each one of our countries, keeping everyone people like Pangi and the organizations that Bristol Myers Squibb supports, our other corporate partners, the governments, the local NGOs, the multilateral organizations, all moving in the same direction underneath the plan that the government has put in place and under the stewardship usually of the Ministry of Health. That's our biggest challenge. But that's a wonderful thing to have as a challenge because it allows us to be so multifaceted. And we're able with these plans to be very customized locally. What we do in Ethiopia with you is very different from what we do in Tanzania. What we do in Botswana is very different from what we do in Zambia. And our constellation of partners, both funders and implementers, is different in every one of the places that we work. So we're able to be nimble and sufficiently coordinated that we can work with local circumstances according to these national plans. But it takes a lot of time and effort. The other big challenge we have is information. Convincing people, both in Africa and here in the West, of the severity of the problem for both cervical and breast cancer. The statistics that you've used, that Ambassador Brinker used this morning, most people don't know those. Mm -hmm. They don't realize how significant a problem these two diseases are for not just the women they affect, but their families and communities in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Latin America and other parts of the world. The CEO of Dow Chemical yesterday talked about intersections and how this summit is really about finding those intersections. We believe we're at the intersection of science, public health, women's empowerment, reproductive and maternal health, and community development. What we do in helping to save women from cervical and breast cancer is really about saving whole communities. Women who are sick are not able to take care of their children, they're not able to be entrepreneurs, they're not able to bring in their crops. If they're teachers or civil servants, they're not able to go to work. And this is a silent epidemic in much of the world, so that lack of knowledge is really a, a critical barrier for us. So what are the opportunities, very quickly? We think, because of what I just said, for any organization that's working in the countries where we are or elsewhere in the developing world, cervical cancer and breast cancer are great opportunities for you. If you care about women as customers, this is something you need to care about. If you care about women as employees, this is something you really need to care about. If you care about your relationship with African governments and your investments in African societies, cervical and breast cancer are two things you need to be worrying about. And we think this is the kind of partnership that can help public institutions and private institutions do smart things about it. I'm gonna forego one of my questions and ask you, uh, one of the questioners, tell us about how First Ladies in Africa are involved in Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon. Great question, thanks for that. First Ladies are critical, and we've got uh, with us the folks who run the First Ladies Initiative at the Bush Institute that have helped to recruit and retain a network of First Ladies uh, who have become incredible advocates. As Pangi said, someone's got to talk to the grandmother. In many societies in which we work, the first lady is considered the mother of the society, the mother of the nation. When she speaks about breast cancer, about cervical cancer, the need for screening, the need for awareness, when she speaks to chiefs and to men and to politicians and asks for resources to go into this fight, people listen. To us, first ladies are the most important advocates we have and allow us to knit together then a network of other influencers that can help get the message out at the political level, with the business community and NGOs, and at the grassroots. 
So, Julie, uh, one of our questioners, and, and Pangi, you can weigh in on this too, can, can one of the panelists describe a specific accomplishment in one of the countries that Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon supports that demonstrates the power of partnership, someone that one partner wanted to achieve but could not have done alone? I can think of a number of them. <laughs> I, I, the one that comes to my mind immediately is in Zambia um, because um, the issue of the pink and the red together is really the capacity to take what is the red ribbon effort, the PEPFAR effort, and add to it the HIV, uh, the HIV programs, the, the cervical cancer, breast cancer programs. So it's leveraging the infrastructure that's already been built for one successful activity and expanding it for another important women's health issue. But often the places where this kind of care is delivered are com completely inadequate. Zambia's made the commitment that in every district of the country, they will have at least one screening clinic um, built on the PEPFAR platform that can also do HPV screening or, or cervical cancer screening. Um, and the tangible result of that was finding a pretty dilapidated clinic that was in no shape for any kind of quality service delivery and bringing the partners in together to rehabilitate the clinic. I mean, literally manually scraping the paint, sweeping the floor, and building a clinic, but then also um, supporting the training of the, the nurse who knew how to do the inexpensive screening and was teaching other nurses and bringing the community together to understand and participate in the effort. So we had a little bit of everyone there, each partner making their own uh, kind of contribution and together a gorgeous new facility for the care and treatment, which by the way has detected a great number of cases of cervical cancer and treated them on the spot with uh, freezing and saved lives of women almost immediately after it was painted. So I think that's a success story. I would say so. Thank you. I, I know well, you I can that. just uh, bring an example from, from Ethiopia. Um, as I have indicated, that we're very much on community mobilization, community entry, and preparing the communities. But they still have to get to the facility. And then some other partners from Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, are bringing in the mission. They are training the, 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 um, um, they are training the, the, the medical staff. But while we were waiting for all of that, the government said, oh, you guys are already there. And why do we are you are waiting for other part of government to make sure that we can bring in the staff. We will bring in the cryotherapy in this mission, in this hospital, so that you can start. So you don't just get from outsiders, but you also influence and catalyze local resources. Terrific. So we're almost out of time, and unfortunately, we're not going to be able to answer the question about Bill's socks. <laughs> so that will <laughs> go wanting, I'm sorry to say. But please, everyone, Join me in thanking our panel today, Bill Steiger, Hangi Inshallah, Julie Gerberding. <laughs>